The loop. The loop. You have the divine spark. The loop. Do or do not. There is no try. The loop. Give me your more. Hey there, this is Misha, and welcome to episode number five of The Loop. Today's conversation is a little bit different than the first four I've had, um, and it is with Roman Barua, who is a entrepreneur, a father, a ex-recruiter. He's also my former manager at the recruitment company I worked at. Super cool guy, and we had a really, really fun conversation, covered a lot. Some career-related topics, some around investment, some around startups, some around content. There's qu- there's quite a bit we went over, but one of the big takeaways and 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 what I I think you will find interesting is Roman's approach to relationship building, building trust, uh, building a network, which is super important just in life in general and in business, and how how he does that, his approach. He makes it sound really easy, but you know he 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 has some specific techniques that he uses and and he has a certain perspective and framing of that so he he shares a little bit about that in in today's conversation which which i found really uh really interesting and uh also talks about doing a startup during the pandemic which was which is really tough but now sort of turning things around um we, we talk about some investment opportunities as well how how they're using or how he has used supercars as uh an investment vehicle no pun intended and we talk about TikTok, Instagram, how to use content to grow your business. So yeah, a lot in there uh, over over an hour conversation, but I really enjoyed this, uh, this one today with Roman and hope you can find something interesting in there for yourself. Hey man, thanks. Uh, thanks for joining me. Cool, cool. Yeah, thanks for having me. So where shall we start? We've known each other for a while. When was it? 2014? Yeah, you, you hired me hmm. into my job as a recruiter. Yeah. And then you quit and I quit and then we stayed oh. friends. So I can't keep track of all the stuff that you're doing. Mm. So I want to, I want to like go through that. So why, why are you <laughs> in a closet? Why don't we start there? Um, so, so during COVID we, um, uh, so for my recruiting business, uh, which is called Wasabit, um, we, we did, we did used to have a WeWork office. Uh, and that was until 2020, like right at the kind of peak of COVID, we uh, we broke. Well, we uh, quit from the contract. And then, wasn't that super yeah. expensive? Uh, I th- it wasn't too bad. It was like we we had one of those really like tiny offices. It was like two. I think it was like 250 thousand yen a month, which is still I think quite a lot for what it is. But then it gives you access for mm-hmm. like unlimited guests, so it was pretty good. Like we could basically bring our whole team they could work in a communal area we could bring guests so it's pretty good um but yeah it was actually funny it was uh just before we um we left uh, we were in one of those offices in the middle i don't know if you know the we work structure but it's got like yeah really big offices that surround like kind of smaller offices of mm-hmm. two or like two to four people so we were in one of the smaller ones inside and then actually rakuten moved in um just before we left and what they did was they took over the whole exterior part but it was weird for for the first um few weeks we could just see into their office so we could see everything like Mm. their whiteboards all of their secrets um whatever they're they're doing right and then suddenly one day we walked in and they had literally put like like white duct tape on all the all the uh all the windows so it became like we couldn't see anything. So it totally blocked our view. So before we could actually see Mount Fuji, like for the sunset. Oh, jeez! And so they completely obstructed our view. Um, and so that's pretty lame. Yeah, they're like a multi-billion-dollar company. They don't even need a WeWork. I don't think they've, they, they they have their own office. Yeah, they didn't really. Well, they were trying to, you know, be a bit more whatever cool. startup friendly, I guess. Or yeah, which is cool. But yeah, so so that was the reason we gave. Like, even though <clears throat> the real reason was COVID, obviously. But we just said our, you know, our our view was restricted, so we'd like to break. <laughs> so someone put duct tape in front of yeah. in front of our view, so we can't we can't see Mount Fuji. So let's just let's just like sit in the closet <laughs> instead. Yeah, let's find a walk-in closet. But like, it, it was <clears throat> so that, Makes sense. that was when we left, and then um, then we basically just moved to like uh, we were already like one hundred percent remote. So that that company. Uh, is, is you know one of the main things I'm doing now. So they, um, it's a hundred percent remote team that does 
like different types of recruiting services. But yeah, we um, <clears throat> we just we just moved to our basically work from home and then renovated the whole first floor of our house, which you've been to before. Um, mm -hmm. And we actually got government dog aid. friendly. Yeah, dog friendly. We have two dogs. Um, and then we got like a government aid, actually, that was quite helpful. You could basically uh, buy like office equipment, <clears throat> including laptops, stuff like that for up to. Oh, by the, by the way, we're, we're both in Japan. Just just throwing that out there. Oh, yeah. So no. OK. Yeah. yeah. So, so it's a Japan government subsidy. And then, yeah, we renovated yeah. everything. Like We basically got new equipment, uh, new furniture. And then, yeah, this what was that like ten thousand dollars or something. Uh, it's basically up to. The equivalent, I think it was like something like 2.3 or 2.6 million yen. So that's about, what, $20,000. Oh, wow. But you ha you spend that. You have to spend it first. And then they, they basically reimburse 66% of it back to you, mm -hmm. um, which is oh, in Japan is such a pain in the ass, as you know, like to do anything that's government related application. I th I, yeah. I don't even know if we still have the money. I think we we did it a year ago and it's like, it was such a nightmare. It was, it's really time consuming. Yeah. But yeah, man, so we're, 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 I'm in the, I just work from here. Uh, occasionally use some other like facilities like the, the Tokyo American club sometimes, uh, which I think I saw you there once yeah. actually. They, they created an office space there as well. Yeah. 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 That's a cool spot. So, so you've got Wasabi, so you've got the recruitment business and then you're also doing your supercars business. Are those the two main things that you're, that you're working on? Yeah, that that's pretty much it. Like, um, I've I've had other projects like here and there, and you know, I, I do speak to yeah. a lot of. There's a lot of opportunities that come up um, through what I'm, you know, what I'm doing, like proposals for like spin-off services or companies. So I've got a few things that I'm working on at the moment. But I've, what I've tried to do, especially in the last year, uh, is just really try and like focus as much as I can. I mean, two companies is a lot in itself. <laughs> Um, and the car, the car business was pretty dormant for, you know, or well, since COVID, I'd say for like at least the first year in particular, there were they were like, there were obviously months where we we did nothing and our staff weren't working. Um, yeah, like, I mean, you're you're basically renting out supercars. <clears throat> it's based on tourism, right? For yeah, for your traffic. So 2019 yeah. was like the peak of that business. So it's it's a it's a car sharing business model. So we don't own any. We're not like a rental company. We don't own like our own stock or our parking lot and mm -hmm. store. We basically just uh, connect with car owners and then create a platform and kind of a concierge and then people rent them out, including tourists. So in 2019, uh, we were making kind of our biggest revenue. It was around the Rugby World Cup, actually. That's when we got most of our bookings. We got some really big um, group bookings that came in. Um, and then, yeah, after that, it was just, it just literally went, like, all of our inquiries and bookings for 2020, mm. there was, you know, that first quarter, they were all cancelled. Um, and then that's it. Like, we literally had nothing that sucks. <laughs> since. So that's two and a yeah. half years ago. Um, Jeez. So that was a bit of a, a hit. So that's where I decided... Um, I actually did go and work in a Japanese recruiting company for about a year on a contract, mm -hmm. left there. And then, yeah, then I decided to really focus on, on Wasabi, where actually my, my wife is actually the CEO of, as you know. Um, so that was, that was an interesting yeah. uh, how, transition. How did you, <laughs> like, I want to, I want to ask about that, like yeah. working, sort of like working for your wife, working with your wife, but, but, um, definitely for, but like before working for your wife it, well how did you like I, I never asked you how did you come up with the idea for the supercars business like where did that come from uh the supercar business it wasn't my idea it was it was a friend of mine he <clears throat> he came up with the idea uh and initially approached me to invest in it and then um i took a bit of time to think about it and then yeah it was me in the end it was four co-founders eventually that that started we grouped together about five hundred thousand dollars and in total there were eight cars um and then yeah we we uh we the idea was just <clears throat> basically because some of us you know had cars and we you know do different events and stuff just casual stuff right like going to the circuit or um going on drives um to like the mountains or whatever there's there's a massive car community so car like if you think about cars as like a hobby or content if you look at like instagram or 
YouTube, like cars is a, that is a massive business in, um, not just car ownership, but it's, it's, there's a whole like geeky car scene, right? And Japan's probably one of the biggest for that as well, which I knew nothing about. So ironically, I, I had no hmm. real interest in cars whatsoever really? until around 2016. I feel like you just were always interested in cars. I don't know why. Man, I, I, I really wasn't. I was really, I was pretty oh. frugal, I'd say, going into 2016. Hmm. And then, you know, I, I didn't really, you know, want, you know, or think about cars as, as um, how can I say, as like a luxury product, let's say. I didn't, I just, I just saw them as, trend, you know, you see cars driving around Tokyo, but you don't really, what do we use cars for in Tokyo is really like getting in taxis, right? Like the transport system's really good here. You wouldn't, I didn't really ever think I'd want to buy a car or plan it, Um but it just it just yeah. it just kind of came about in 2016, um, kind of as a as an investment opportunity actually, uh, and that's when I. What do you mean? Ba- basically, there's you know, um, as a as an independent contractor or a business owner, um, you can obviously there's lots of things you can invest in, right? Like the main one is property. It's basically in, investing in assets um, that you know. They depreciate, but then they can also appreciate in, in price in the future. So it was just like a portfolio investment. Like I, it, There's a lot of – so, for example, there's a lot of people that were investing in overseas properties um, mm-hmm. outside of Japan and actually in, in, in Japan as well, right, like accumulating small yeah. property rentals and then you, you, get, a lo- you get like a 100% loan um, and then, you know, in 15 years, 20 years or whatever um, – you know, all, all of the the accumulated equity that you've made through renting out the property is is how you can build wealth. Well, cars cars mm-hmm. operate in a similar way, but it's it's a very different lifespan. So, a car loan, for instance, will be eight years, not twenty five. Mm-hmm. So, it was it was just like an interesting idea where you could make kind of investment, um, but it's a lot more. It's just a lot more flashy, right, and a lot more. Um, tangible because you can drive around it. yeah so that's the- yeah it's, it's it's like useful also it's not just like some apartment you're renting out these are actually cars that you can drive around but I, I mean like from a tax savings perspective and investment perspective is it like using those cars frequently does that how does that impact sort of the the car as an investment i mean do you want to yeah. be using it a lot that that's that's a really good question so that in the end yeah, we learned. I learned a lot about that in the last five years. So long, long story short, is if you pick the right cars, and if you use them sparingly, there is a chance you can make capital appreciation in the long term. Um, it's not going to be like two or three years usually. Although, if you had bought certain cars two or three mm-hmm. years ago, um, and recently we've been making some like marketing videos about this, you would have you could have doubled your money basically. Um, and that there's a lot of reasons behind that actually. Oh, cool. But, um, yeah. So you have some marketing videos about that. You said, so there, there's some stuff out there. I think so. Yeah. I, I'm actually, I'm not sure if cool. we've at this right moment, if we've, um, we've published them, but, uh, we will be like basically pick cool. car picks, like what we think will appreciate in price. So there, there's a whole industry around that. Um, mm-hmm. so that's how I got into it. And then on, on the back of that, it's like, if, you know, similar um to to property like you want to get a yield on it right if you if you buy a property you want to rent it out and you want to make some cash flow back from it cars can Mm -hmm. operate in a similar way so that's why we created the car sharing business model so kind of like what what Mm -hmm. airbnb did right where people were essentially buying out apartments or even renting them out and then you know re-renting them through airbnb let's say um that's essentially what we created with cars yeah Yeah, I mean, there's there's a big there's a big platform marketplace in the U.S. called Turo.com, which I used when I rented a I rented a Tesla with my friend Joseph. We we did a little road oh, trip. Oh yeah, Turo, uh, yeah. Like a year ago. Mm-mm. Yeah, they, they, I mean, I don't know. They're like probably Series B or C or something. They're they're yeah. a bit further along right now, but um, right. yeah, there's like a ton a ton of ton of options. Like you just you just type in like uh you know I want to pick up the car in Dallas mm. you know ninety dollars a day or something and they're just like a bunch of Teslas a bunch of yeah. a bunch of different cars you can choose from and uh, it's pretty easy and it, it like I think for me the reason I used it is because 
maybe this is similar to, to what you guys are seeing is if you go to a regular car, like rental agency, mm. like you don't know what car you're going to get often. Yeah. Maybe in Japan you do, I don't know, but in, in the U S like right. you're like, I want a four door sedan and you get there and like, it's just whatever they have on the parking lot. Yeah. So there's no consumer <laughs> choice. Yeah. It's very standardized and it's, it's just, uh, like mass market transportation, play right like they're, they're yeah di- they're, yeah so that that's that that's the key to our business it's more like experiential and like more like okay i want to have a special occasion or experience so all, no, yeah. we, we have some diversity in the car group now but the the core of our business is like cars like i i guess one hundred and fifty thousand dollars or even 200 to four hundred thousand dollars in value that you would you just don't you're not going to drive just for transportation like you would you would the driving experience is why you would book it, right? Uh, as like a special occasion or yeah. if you're a car enthusiast, which again is is what I've learned a lot about in the last few years, like how big that market is. And um, yeah, that I've, I've kind of got into cars a lot more recently. Yeah. And like, like you said, like Airbnb, you have people just renting out apartments and then, and then putting them on Airbnb as hosts. And you can do the same thing with cars, right? You can own four or five cars and yeah. then just rent them out on the platform exactly so in what you mentioned about churro i I remember researching about them a few years ago there's people that make a living from it so as you said they'll choose you know probably a little bit of an older car uh, where they can buy it cheaper than they can make bigger margins or yield right um and they'll make a living off it they'll just rent out a car as a as a side income or passive income kind of um yeah so yeah same, same with thing Airbnb. yeah i met a guy an engineer who did that yeah yeah and if you find the right spot like it's all about supply and demand so there's a lot of science to it and strategy right if you position the car in the right place or location where like yeah there's an undersupply of taxis or whatever that's ki- kind of like it kind of crosses the uber model as well right um especially in the u.s i think yeah. where transportation kind of sucks but here here so immediately you're not like the the playing ground is totally different here, right? Like it's like transportation is not really um, an issue here. Like trans, like um, yeah. the metro is yeah, so Japan. Big. I mean, to- Tokyo is like New York. You don't really need. Yeah. I mean, it's it's not it's not like New York. I mean, it's in in that the the metro and you know everything's safer. Bus system <laughs> is way better and safer and clean. Yeah. So it's actually a lot better than New York. But like, you don't need a car in New York. Is the point, right? You can just get around. Yeah. So so what we so yeah. what we say to like the car owners that we work with on our platform is you're you're probably not going to make a, a profit. Like we we don't ever sell it as oh buy a you know a Ferrari or Lamborghini or whatever and you're going to make a profit on you know on your um investment in the short in the short term it's it's definitely you have to pick the right car and you have to be patient um that you're going to see capital yeah. appreciation in the long term hopefully keep the mileage relatively low so you uh, we even have a cap system where some of the cars we we cap how many bookings that that we'll use right um and yeah and really where you'll make, yeah, again, you'll make money on both the appreciation and, and also the asset depreciation can be beneficial for, you know, your, your business as well in terms of cash flow in the short term. So there's, there's a, is, is this like you're, so you're, you're from the UK, but like, yeah, does this apply only to like the appreciation, depreciation, how you're using these cars as an investment? Does that apply only in Japan or are people doing this in different countries? The appreciation applies anywhere. So, so okay, yeah. I'll give you an example. We just got um, a Ferrari Scuderia, which is uh, it's like a 2008, 2009 uh, car, which they built in relatively short supply. They only built 1,600 globally. And it's, it's basically like a stripped out race version of the Ferrari, the new Ferrari of that time. So whenever Ferrari Mm -hmm. make cars, they always make a few different versions and there's always like the fast version and it's basically lighter. Mm -hmm. They use like, um, kind of cooler, more expensive material that's lighter. Right. Um, and it looks good, like a lot of carbon fiber. So anyway, that, the reason we got that is because we're like, okay, for this, this time, we want to pick something that we feel has already started going up. I mean, it's, it's gone up, you know, not a match actually maybe in the last few years, it's been relatively stable globally. Um, mm-hmm. But a lot of car prices have gone up in the last year, especially that's partially to do mm-hmm. to, with the chip shortage and global supply issues and stuff like that. 
Um, but we're seeing like collectibles have gone up tremendously, like watches as well, right? Recently. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, we see that trend continuing just with the whole way that the world economy is running. Um, so, yeah. so we're, we're advising, like if a client comes to us and says, Hey, we think like, I want to, you know, in, in, and by the way, the other reason is people just, you know, it's kind of a lifestyle choice as, as well. Right. I've, I've had people come mm-hmm. to me and say, Hey, you know, I kind of want to just do something fun. I want to make a fun investment. I want to buy something just for fun, but then I want to, yeah. I can't justify like to my wife spending 200,000 or $300,000 on this, but if I can explain that I can rent it out and make some some income that mm. kind of partially covers my costs, then yeah. it's it's yeah, it's yeah. more acceptable. <laughs> so so that yeah, that and it's all, it's well. more fun than than just like a piece of art, also, right? Like, I mean, pe- people will do the same thing with with paintings. Yeah, I think uh, it maybe is, it's a little bit different, it's a, but it's similar psychology. Yeah. Like if you look, like some of the friends I've made in the last couple of years since I started this business, you know, they're so passionate and like. Um, they cars is everything like whether it's the design whether it's the, yeah. the engine the performance um there's so it's a very it's very deep right the engineering is is very very um can get very geeky and like so tonight actually yeah. i'm meeting like there's four or five of us all meeting up we're all bring, bringing our cars and then they just love talking about cars like it's, it's yeah. like a community of people like that so so that yeah that that's also um yeah another thing you're kind of selling to almost is like yeah it's it's like it's like an all there's this offline aspect to it right like you're actually and it's something especially during covid sort of you miss that a bit or i miss that a bit where yeah you, know, you can invest in like nfts or you can invest in in some like online real estate thing you never even have to visit visit the apartment but it's all just like in the air right it's all digital and um it's kind of cool to be investing in, in some physical object in a way. Um, yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah, definitely. And like that, that, that actually really resonates because I had, um, I've had 10 angel investors now for the supercar business and predom. let me just think, I pretty much all of them are, I would say like car people or well, most of them, not all of them. Makes sense. And they're just, yeah, it, it's kind of an easy pitch in a way because yeah, like they're, um, they're really passionate and they just, they get it. Exactly. Yeah. It's like, you know, the whole psychology of angel investment or well, most of it is about kind of passion and trust. And when, when you've got something that, that they're really passionate about, it's, uh, it's kind of made things smoother. Yeah. 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 I mean, that, that, that's a good segue into like this, like your ability. I mean, I've noticed just over the last few years, like you have this huge network, at least in Japan and you've been able to build it, you know, over, over quite a few years, but like through recruitment, through startups, through investment, and you're just like really good at that, right? The, the relationship building and, and the network and, and, you know, some people will invest in your company and you have all these opportunities that arise from, from, from that network. Like, how do you do that? You know, what's, how do you build a network? How do like, how do you build these relationships? Cause like, I just think you're really good at it. And I don't know why, <laughs> I don't know what your secret is. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. Like, I guess through re- recruitment, um, like, I don't know. So recruitment is, is interesting because we, we both did it like, I guess together at the same time as well. And you know that yeah. like there's so many people in recruitment that have different skill sets and it's, it's very diverse actually. Like you can, you can have like very introverted people versus extroverted and they can all be successful. But I think, um, mm. yeah, maybe the first thing is just, the extroverted personality types tend to be <clears throat> they're kind of like more natural networkers um and they're I, i'd say a lot of my business in recruitment was just from like making genuine and kind of authentic relationships so not like i don't know man, are you an extrovert do you consider yourself an extrovert prob- yeah probably i guess so. <laughs> not and these days i don't yeah i'm not really so as sociable as i was i think when when we first met, I was still, you know, drinking and going out and, you know, living a certain lifestyle in Tokyo, yeah. right? Like as you do. Um, and socially, I, I guess I've always been like that. So that's, that helps. I think professionally you can translate that, right? Um, to, yeah. to I think, I think it, the, the data backs that up because you, you have two dogs <laughs> and I was reading that extroverts tend to be dog people. Is that right? I didn't. So I that didn't makes perfect that. sense. Yeah. yeah. 
emotionally unstable like, people d- need, on need animals yeah <laughs> um no, I, yeah yeah um so look it, it's just <laughs> i don't know there's no real secret it's just um there's just times where i'm like just doing like meeting a lot of people and doing a lot of things and i i think for me it was always like just trying to like um you know like the typical networking event you go to and it, it happens in cities all around the world where it's, yeah. it's super awkward right because everyone's like it's kind of like a big sigh when you get there like oh i've got to do it. Like, like you know you've got to have that awkward you know kind of an yeah. elevator pitch ish stroke like introduction and it's kind of like the speed dating mentality as well it's like a bit awkward and um yeah and you, and you also want to sound you want to sound not cool but like you want to be memorable in some way right like you want to you want people to remember you, but then you also don't want to stand there talking to a, a boring person and, yeah. and like, you're trying to figure out who, who's, who's worth talking to. And, and, uh, that, that can be pretty exhausting, especially for an introvert. Yeah, I think so. So I think one of the best, um, there's a guy that I think we both know, um, uh, and he, I won't say his name, but he, he, I remember when I first met Top him, secret. he's uh, he's a marketer. He's, he, he's yeah. marketing from like a like online travel agency background. But anyway, he, he basically said like he's an introvert and it he gets tired really quickly by having to speak to someone mm-hmm. he doesn't know. Uh, yeah. and it and it just it's just not fun for him. Whereas that his definition of an extrovert, which I I kind of agree with, is like the more you speak to someone that you don't know, you kind of gain energy and you have more and more fun. Like you can kind of yeah. keep going, right? So yeah. I definitely think that helps. Um but look, look just from um the nature of our job or in recruiting is you just, you meet so many people, like you have to meet Mm -hmm. clients. So you'll meet a ton of CEOs and people that are hiring people. And then you meet Mm. probably more candidates, right? The amount of people I remember back in the day, we have like KPIs to like, you have to interview whatever five people a week or whatever it was. So I think naturally what, what I found was um, in my, how long did, before I, I guess got into a startup, it was 10 years exactly actually that I was just doing the recruiting job. So you just accumulate so many um, contacts through that and, and so many conversations. And I think if you're good at that initial first conversation, you make a good impression because a lot of people aren't right. There's a lot of people that are really awkward about it or they just don't, they want it. They don't want to take it further. There's a lot of people in mm. recruitment. They look at the job as this is my job and, we've heard this loads of times when, when I finish at six, I don't want to like speak to candidates or clients. <laughs> I just want to mm-hmm. go home and shut off. And then that's mm. fine. And that's, that's, that's totally mm. cool. But I was always like, I totally enjoy just actually going and hanging out with, with, um, you know, if I, yeah. if I like, I wonder them, where that I comes like from. Them. Yeah. But I think, it's, yeah, I think you're that's, similar. That's pretty big, well. right? I, I think so yeah. for me, it, it always came down to people that I liked and had a shared interest with. So one of, one of the things that I did um, was I started playing golf in 2012. And there's a lot of people that like hate on golf. They're like, oh, you know, what a bunch of assholes are just going and, you know, rich person sport or whatever. There's a lot of like, neg- there, there is some negativity yeah. around it, right? That it's kind of pretentious or whatever. Yeah. But I just re- like, I really genuinely enjoyed playing it. And um, I remember that's how we got, <clears throat> we got a lot of business from that. Because a lot of the, the clients, especially in Japan, they, they really like playing golf as well. So you'd go and spend – so here, like, golf is like a full-on, like, you know, day out. <laughs> it's like a, it's like a long school trip. Yeah. Like you have to go out. I mean, J- Japan has a ton of golf courses. Like, I don't, yeah. I don't know the numbers, but it's like some, some of – like, there's like hundreds or thousands or something. It's ridiculous. Yeah. So there's, I know there's, there's 5,400 ranges because one of my clients sells wow. golf ranges, but I don't know how many courses there are, but it's going to be, wow. yeah, probably in the thousands. But <clears throat> yeah, most of them were built in a bubble like in the, in the, I guess, 70s, 80s, and then into the 90s. But yeah. yeah, so that that whole, that's just a good example of how like, I think that just fit well with something that I really enjoyed doing and then meeting like-minded people. And it was, a lot of it was because we were connected, like they were they were candidates or clients, right? Um, and that, that just mm. naturally helped a lot because you, you can build like genuine relationships from that. Um, yeah, so that was one thing that's, that that's, a, that's well. like a really big point. Cause, cause like, I think a lot of people, so going back to what you were saying, 
people that are sort of clocking out as, at a certain time or they just don't really want to, you know, their job description is their job description, right? So they're they're going to put in a certain amount of effort and maybe they still do a really good job, but um, yeah. sort of going the extra mile of like building long-term relationships. What you're saying is that the, the only real way to do that, like genuine way to do that is you, you have to connect with people that you like, right? And then you have something in common with and like do do those activities that you like. Like if you hate golf, right? If you're, or you're just not yeah. good at it or it's just, you don't enjoy it, then it's, it's not really going to be um, something you do for the long term, and you're not going to be able to build those relationships like in the same way that you have, but maybe you can through tennis or maybe, you know, football or like something else. Right. Yeah. There's loads of stuff, um, man. Like, especially yeah. if you live in a city like Tokyo, it is like, um, yeah. we used to do running. Do you remember? I don't know if you ever joined, but we just, at, uh, at wall and case we Once. used to have like run, like just do random stuff. Right. Um, yeah. But yeah the, the relationships part, like, there's a lot of businesses that are still very like uh let's say traditional and relationship driven so i think a lot of mm-hmm. like industries what? like that like real estate i think recruitment for sure yeah. even like stock stock brokerage um advertising agencies a- any kind of red ocean agency model where you have choice right you can choose who you want to essentially do business with and, and give money to mm. i think there's an element of those until like technology companies are different because a lot of their value proposition is around that kind of intrinsic technology, right? That, that disruption, Mm. but in a traditional business that I think the relationship part carries through. So one example, another example I've got is one of my first ever clients was the Royal Bank of Scotland back in 2007. And Mm. the CTO um, was, was one of my first clients. I used to go meet him like, regularly he hired like five contractors from us at the time which i placed this is when i was at robert walters and um we we kept in contact i used to meet him for lunch like regularly like once a month we talk about how this team's doing oh i can definitely hear that um and then are you okay are we okay are you are you muting yeah i'm I'm just gonna mute it when when they're (laughs) drilling all right i can still talk i guess cool so so that guy this is this is interesting in 2018 um i just got a random message for him on linkedin and he said hey like can we meet up basically so i went and met him and he was leaving the royal bank of scotland he'd been there god he'd been there like 15 years uh but long story short he basically said look i'm i've you know worked for 20 years um and now i want to do some i want to try something different and and he basically you know, became an investor and like uh, a co-founder with me for the for the car business. We just had a meeting just now, so that 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 kind of came full circle from, um, yeah. Just I think recruitment is a great way to meet people and build relationships. And if you if you can have like build trust and like genuine relationships, it it came back. I mean, he invested. Uh, he's one of my angel investors, and um, he's been the CTO for all of our technology projects that we're doing. Um, so that's another part of the car sharing business, just off the back of building our own car sharing platform. We had car manufacturers come to us um, and ask us to build different products for them as well, which we've, we've done both in Japan and, and Australia, actually. Yeah. 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 I mean, you're, you're talking a lot about recruitment and AI. I agree with you. You, you have to be going out a lot. It's just sort of a sales job. Um, but then I feel like, you could probably still, that's still applicable to other jobs, right? I mean, yeah. if you're in marketing or if you're in product or even if you're an engineer, it's like maybe it's less less so part of your actual day-to-day job, but I don't think there's anything stopping you from going out and still being part of activities and like building those relationships. Um, yeah. But yeah. I think... Um, I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, look, so if you're talking about like networking or business development generally, like there's, there's very sophisticated um, ways that companies do that. Uh, it's, it can be very targeted, right? Like you'll have companies like software companies that will have like a partnership team, for instance, that is kind of part of that lead generation funnel. Um, and in Japan, that's really prominent because Japan has some of the, the kind of biggest and oldest, they're called system integrators, you know, like Toshiba, Sharp, all those types of companies. So I feel like there's that part of um, 
I guess, building relationships. Yeah, I mean, so, so we're talking then, about two different things here. So yeah. it's like business. The other one. So it's just like people and business, yeah. right? It's, it's... I think there's, bit, so there's one, that side of it. The other side of it is, like, as you mentioned, like an individual level, I think, especially nowadays, I think that's really powerful. So you can, I think that's the best way to get jobs, frankly. Like, so whenever I meet um, friends that, I, I probably can't help through like recruitment channels and there's a lot of them, right? Cause recruitment can be very specific. Um, my general advice to people is like the best way you're going to find a job is through your, you know, uh, direct kind of like direct networking. So there's a difference between like this, obviously direct applications. You go online, you find the open jobs and you apply to them. But I think it's very easy to, or in theory is to target the companies you want to work for or the, or the people that you would, uh, you would want to work for. And just connect with them and um explain explain this to me because this is like it's really obvious to to us yeah because we're recruiters right, like right. we do this every day sure but i mean what is that like what does that look like in practice what do you do well i think you know i hear it there's a there's a couple of people that i know that do it really really well like there's um you know individuals they can they're usually senior folks in companies they're like a lot of some founders and ceos they're natural networkers so they'll tend to hire people that they know in their first degree network people they've met or friends of of those but you as you said like as a recruiter you know that you can very quickly engineer that so simply if you know if it was me and i i was looking for a job i would i would find a list of the companies that i like to work for irrespective of whether they have uh, an open position or not and that's something else that you should always keep in mind right because companies that are that could hire you they just they may it just it's all about timing so whether or not there is like a job description that's public at the moment online or linkedin or whatever um i think it's really important to um to know that they could at any time create a budget and hire some someone or someone might leave right um, usually the, the two main reasons someone a company hires is one for expansion and new headcount or a replacement. So having a network that is, I don't know, a list of 10 companies and knowing who those hiring managers are, that's actually pretty easy to do, right? Because you can you know who they are on LinkedIn. You can connect with them for free. Um, and I, I think most like hiring managers, especially nowadays, are, are are open to that as well because it is so high. It's so hard to hire. Um, so that's one. That's just one idea or one way you could do it. Yeah. Right? You could you could connect yeah. with your ideal boss and ask him or her if they're open to meeting for like lunch or coffee or. It's it's super straightforward whatever. in a way, right? And like, even if it's a big tech company, you have. I don't know all the stats, like all the breakdowns for each fang company, but if it's like, I know for like Google, for example, they get what 20 or 30% of, of their hires through, through referrals. Yeah. Um, and then some percentage through direct applications and then maybe 20, 30% from internal recruiters who are reaching out. So it's, it's not like most people are not just getting a job by applying online. And, uh, I remember one guy I spoke to who's a coach. I mean, he, the way he got his job at Google, like literally it was like the simplest message. Mm. He just messaged a random person at Google. Sorry, not a random person, but like someone that would be like a hiring manager in that team and said, Hey, you know, I'm at Ericsson as a, as a, a product manager. I'm looking for a job at Google. I'm interested in this job. Yeah. Can you refer me? Nice. And the guy's like, yeah, sure. And then he refers them and he gets the job. Yeah. I mean, obviously you have to have the skills and the inter- you know, go through the interview and everything, but just mm. you bypass that initial a- application stage. And all literally all he did was send this message, yeah. like two sentences. It's funny you mentioned Google because Google doesn't uh, work. Typically, I don't think they work with recruitment agencies. So whenever yeah. I've had yeah. like friends that said like, okay, I'm looking for a job. There's one guy who I played in the same soccer team um as for a few years he's he's a product manager at google i oh, know that sorry i think he's in sales uh but he's my go-to guy i'm always like hey would you mind introducing this, another friend of mine and i think I, definitely one person i introduced um got hired through that as well like you say i mean they still have to pass the interview yeah. the interview process is not going to be easier just because you have a referral yeah. especially that's another interesting thing because i think in some companies you can get some bias <laughs> from referrals but I, from what i've seen 
like with Amazon or the fan companies, I don't think it's going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. But so, something you said that was like just super interesting going back to our conversation about relationship building. So like even as so out, you have golf, right. Oh, and then yeah. you have the, the, the football team you're part of. And like, obviously you can just go play sports and have fun and like, you know, drink a beer afterwards and your friends, but then what you've done and what I, what you do really well is like, Hey, all these people actually have jobs. All these people have skills and mm. they have different sides. Right. Yeah. And so one guy you know, wants to get a job at Google or, you know, works at Google. And, and so you're sort of building your network in that way. Yeah. Just being really open. I, yeah, I think in, uh, recruiters get bad, um, reputations for a lot of reasons. Right. And they they can be very just, focused on immediate like personal gain or commission or whatever but um yeah i think just uh that that definitely helps like just genuinely just connecting people to to who you know uh objectively as well like i feel like yeah i feel like one of the problems with recruiting is like you're just you're always looking at like your target or whatever um and trying to fulfill that but what what will hold better in the long term is if you just yeah if you just help people that are in your network um whether whether or not you actually gain out of it is not really important because in the long term you you probably will if you have you know a good reputation and like genuinely help people so i think that yeah that does help yeah yeah you 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 talk about you're talking about recruiters because they have some they had some sort of there's some negative um you know opinions but i think just i was actually talking to christian uh who, who you know um we used to work with briefly right yeah yeah well in case i was i met him for dinner yesterday and he was actually talking about this too and like recruiters are pretty hot right now and they've been for the last couple of years just because companies have been hiring so many people so becoming a recruiter has actually become quite trendy oh really and yeah yeah like when i moved to europe uh, i was in europe for a couple of years before i moved back to tokyo and everyone was like, Hey, you should be a recruiter. And I was like, what, <laughs> why would I do that? Yeah. I, was, I already did that. And it was just like a cool thing to do. And so I think the, the narrative has changed. I think it's a, it's a taken a bit more seriously now. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. Maybe not in Japan, but I mean, uh, at least in the, in, in Europe. Yeah. I, I don't know about Japan. I mean, it seems, it seems like being a, a foreigner in Japan, it's like, yeah, there's a lot of, um, stereotype, like, you know, you're you're either an English teacher or a recruiter type thing. Um, so I don't know if that applies here. I don't yeah. know if it's maybe maybe it's, it's like internal recruiters. Yeah. <laughs> oh, internal recruiters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, that, yeah. that's definitely become a lot more of a common job in the last yeah last few years, right? Talent acquisition um, or whatever. But yeah, yeah. What what is it like to work with your wife? <laughs> well, back to that. We took a huge seg. Oh, we never covered it. <laughs> <laughs> I think, yeah, I think it's been really good actually. I think it's been quite like humbling experience. But uh, <laughs> um, what do you mean? She just like well, it's because she, there's, it there's no filter. What does she right? do? So yeah, there's literally like I think I needed that anyway. Like someone just to give you really direct, honest feedback. Because I was, uh, you know, in a in a few different positions where, like, especially when you're in management, you can kind of get stuck in your own like. I don't know, echo chamber of like, I don't know. Yeah. Especially if you're at the top, right? No one's giving you feedback usually. Yeah, I, I not think the, so. the honest feedback that you need. I think so. And so that, that really helps. Um, so it's been challenging because the, the, the opposite point of that is because there's no filter, there's no, there's sometimes no professional lines. Um, so it's harder to like have certain conversations, um, you, you kind of skip a lot of things as well. Like you, I don't know, the, the communication is definitely like it takes some getting used to on both sides. Like one, yeah, just getting really direct feedback, but then you're, you're not having these kind of professional conversations that you need to have right. sometimes. So, Sorry, that's a bit vague. So, <laughs> so it's very, it's very just like, it's just really straightforward and you just cut to the chase and, uh, and that's like, that sounds very raw. Like it's very honest. Yeah, right? I think so. And and also um, I've never really worked when I think about it, I've never worked. Like if we had to say like who I've worked for or like my, you know, bosses, let's say they've all been male always. 
So it's the first time mm. I've worked with like a, a female CEO or, you know, and she happens to be your wife. So yeah. like that, just like make it, make it even more fun. <laughs> but it's, it's really good. I, I really like, I really see it, you know, there, there, there can and should be a shift in like diversity and, you know, management and, and leadership because I think there's a lot of like ego driven decision making and, and management style that like, for sure. I, definitely had in you know a few companies i've worked in and probably you you did as well right frankly yeah. like even yeah when we worked together because you're just it's it's just it's that kind of uh, sports team type of culture that broods in a lot of uh, sales uh, focused organizations and i feel yeah. like um yeah working with her has been yeah pretty pretty interesting for the last it's been about a year now and i feel like yeah, I feel like a lot more balanced uh, than I probably was before, and yeah, it's been like good, in man. terms of in terms of your perspective and and like who you're hiring that sort of thing. Uh, okay, it's more personal. It's just more myself. I kind of know. Oh. I, I think I know okay. my weaknesses better than ever, and like trying to mm. yeah address them. And like she's she's always there to kind of you know give feedback and remind yeah. you of your weaknesses. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's just yeah. really annoying. But, um, yeah, but it has helped. Yeah, it's. Well, that, that, that's good though. That's, yeah. that's rare. Right. I think, I think like, again, if you're a founder or CEO, it's like, it doesn't matter. Like, uh, it's just hard to get that feedback sometimes. Um, I think so. so. That's, that's interesting. And then we're very different. Like, so going back to like introversion and extroversion yeah. topic, she's completely introverted. Um, so in terms of running the company and she's, got, she's a much better people manager and communicator than I am. Mm. So she's, Really? Yeah. Uh, you're pretty. I feel like you're pretty good at that. Uh, I don't know, man. Maybe. May I think I've had my my, <laughs> my my best years behind me of like being able to work in yeah. a company organization. It's. I think my pay, my uh, agreeability is declining. Mm. That makes sense. You become more disagreeable over time. I think so. And then like she she's just really really good at um like having giving feedback in a positive non emotional way i think she's much better than mm. that but yeah man, it's going really well i think this has been the best it's yeah. gone better than i could have expected so when i i joined a year ago and since then we've like doubled uh the size of the team almost exactly we're at 10 nice. people now we're now 20 and then um we more than i think we quadrupled the client base um so yeah it's, nice. it's that's that's going well yeah awesome man um what else what else do you want to talk about? I don't know, man. What do you want to? Um, well, we covered a lot. Yeah, we covered a lot. I mean, I was really interested in the relationship stuff. Um, oh, what about some of the um, what some like the online stuff that you're doing, like the brand building? Because oh yeah, yeah, you know, we talked a lot That's about a like o- offline activities. Yeah, but then you're doing a lot of stuff on on TikTok now, and then you're you're on LinkedIn, and you just <laughs> you have this balance where I think a lot of people are like 100% mm. on social, like 100% online. And they're just like, you know, they're writing or they're vlogging yeah. and that's it. And then you don't really see them doing anything offline or at least from, from where I'm sitting. Yeah. Uh, but you're, you're, you're obviously you're, you're mixing these things. So I'm curious how you balance those and what your approach is. So yeah, just trying to um, do a lot more um, video content recently. And so both both businesses are pretty easy to build like video content strategies. The car business is is much easier because it's very visual and it's like we have five years worth of like content that we never really exposed and we never really told our story in that kind of well we did we did know vlogging for instance where when that was really taking off um, and now recently a lot of you know engagement is as you know is moving to short form. Um, you know, yeah. TikTok uh, reels, shorts on YouTube, and so on. So, the last few months, since February, if you look at like our the supercar Instagram, we've really started just focusing on reels. But before that, we were trying to consistently vlog, and what we found with vlogging was it's just a lot of work. Like it's you know, it's long form. It's you're, yeah. you're targeting ten minutes for the YouTube algorithm, right? Like to get enough views and to, to monetize in theory. Mm-hmm. Um, and that just took a lot mm-hmm. of work and, and even the actual vlogging should be easy, but when you, when you have cars, like you, tr- you're always trying to maybe overcomplicate it. So long story short, we did vlogging for about six months, 
started releasing a vlog a week and did okay. Like it was just, wasn't anything mm-hmm. crazy in terms of engagement or views, but I was like happy that we started. And then we just mm-hmm. switched to short form video because you, you just reduced that whole production cycle um, by a, a mm. massive factor and you can just put out a lot more content quicker. Um, so for, for the car stuff, it's easy because you just get, you know, a video of whatever, like us driving in a car or showing a, the car lineup or whatever it is. And mm-hmm. the whole concept of trending music is a big way to create engagement. So people are like often searching on Instagram, at least by the songs, right? Yeah. Um, so that, that, yeah. That, same on TikTok. You have like some, some trending song yeah. and everyone makes a video with that song. So TikTok's yeah. much harder because you need to, the, the best like content creators there are doing a lot more creative, more like, random skit based. Like there's a lot more acting involved actually. And that's why you see a lot of the tick, like the yeah. best TikTokers now are like, I don't want to say like failed artists, but there's 12. <laughs> yeah. There's, yeah. That, that too. But so it's a really interesting world, and, and I think what you said about, like you described it as offline and online, I think it's another way that I'm looking at it is like there's a lot of corporate and um, professional services businesses. Again, recruitment is one of them and, and others. And mm-hmm. when you think about TikTok, it's as you said, it's like 12-year-olds, you know, girls dancing or whatever. But they, that's not the reality. Like there's definitely an in-between. And I've seen... You know, I've got For sure. a, a friend, um, a, a guy that was actually a member of the car club. His his wife uh, is a lawyer who became a content creator and has just blown up in the last year, especially. It's a girl called Erica cool. Kohlberg. And she was quite inspiring because I, we used to meet her quite regularly during COVID. And she was really starting to become prominent. At that time, she was really on YouTube. And then she went mm-hmm. nuts. I think she's like 7 million plus on TikTok and Wow. maybe wow. three or four million on Instagram, just literally over a short period of time. And that was a really good bridge between, okay, a professional services background and then trying to add value as a creator. But now I'd say, mm. well, she's not 100% a creator. She's got some other online businesses. Right. So sort of the, what I'm trying to figure out right now is, as you said, how to bridge like some of the online content marketing and create mm. value Um to customers and it's and it's working like even this morning like last night we posted a video of like what car should we buy next on the platform and the Mm. engagement is incredible like i get and it's not just because i've got two different businesses i think they kind of reinforce each other in a way and it's kind of like the noise that you may get from having like content on this company it just makes makes people in your network think of you right it's all about yeah you know yeah. attention that's that's basically what it is and i think there's a lot of negative parts of that if you're like 11 30 to 13 year old female there's a lot of like mental health um sure. issues that the world faces because of the way like instagram's engagement works supposedly but when you think about a business if you're if your goal again in a competitive market is to get noticed mm. then it's i think it's absolutely the best way to at, at least experiment with and you know i'm i'm 39 now so I feel like now I just don't really care about myself so much that I'm just going to try stuff. <laughs> I'm, I'm married. I've got two kids. Like I don't really, I don't care about, you know, being cool or whatever. <laughs> um, yeah. You can just try shit. Yeah. Um, that's interesting. I like the way you frame that. Cause obviously there's, there's a lot of, uh, you know, obviously there's a lot of negativity that yeah. can come from social media and yeah, just getting sucked into that, that rabbit hole. Um, it's not, it's not really good oh, for you if, if you're just I tell you obsessed what, with it. You have to go in a minute. No, no, I'm going to read out. I want to read out a message that we, I just got from one of our ex coworkers. Nice. Right? Do it. Um, just get a normal car and stop being a bellend about Ferraris. You should be able to guess who that is. Um, but, <laughs> but basically like, that's the thing, right? Like, you know, it is awkward and like putting yourself out there, you're going to get a lot of. I wouldn't say it's. Oh hate- yeah, I, 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 I know who it is. Yes, <laughs> I don't. I wouldn't say it's like hateful, but like there's a lot of um, you know, it's just weird for people. Even we're not exactly the same generation, I and mean, we're not that far apart. But um, yeah, yeah, I think there's a lot of that as well. Like there's a lot of you know um, people involved in professional services that never had to think about and still don't. I mean, if you're if you're a headhunter or a recruiter in a very niche market where they don't use job boards, yeah. 
then you don't you yeah. literally don't need to think about social media still right now yeah it's all relationship based yeah um, and then there's a lot there is a lot of crap yeah. content out there and you know people get irritated yeah. by stuff fair enough so uh, yeah I, I feel like it's worth experimenting though and finding you know something that isn't hopefully too irritating to everyone um, but uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, we've got we've seen a massive jump in online inquiries recently. I think partially because there is some you know travel coming back to Japan. Um, but generally, mm -hmm. I, I feel like a lot of the stuff we're doing online is reaching people, is getting noticed. Um, and yeah, that's if you can compete for people's attention, then you're more likely to be successful. I think in your business. Yeah, for sure. And then, like from a creative point of view, you're obviously you're doing a bunch of stuff yeah or you you have been like are you doing a lot more creative hands-on creative work now like editing videos or making scripts like yeah. how involved are you in that yeah it's a good question so i i i like created my own second personal instagram account um because it's really awkward having like family and friends from a long time ago seeing like you know whatever i'm doing especially with the car business because it can <laughs> it can look like a big like a flex right there's a lot of so there's a lot of online people that literally are doing that they're competing for personal attention and validation right yeah and that's honestly yeah. not what my goal is like it's, it's to promote my business so uh, i created a different account and then started playing around with instagram reels TikTok's still really difficult for me i can't really get any any traction on that and i still need to figure out how to do that and then you know one of my my company employees is kind of in charge of that but personally yeah i have got involved and just experimenting with um how to create videos how to write scripts um mm -hmm. I, I bought like three different cameras i'm about to buy another one nice this camera right it's, it's the insta 360 so you can put it on an mm -hmm. invisible selfie stick behind yeah, yeah. the car so it looks like mm -hmm. you know like the grand theft auto uh third person view when you're behind yeah, the car. Yeah, yeah you can literally re recreate it so we're gonna, oh, that's we're gonna pretty get cool. that it, you should do like a grand theft auto skit yeah we should hijacking a, a ferrari in in tokyo that, that's a good idea maybe we should yeah, yeah but you're welcome <laughs> <laughs> maybe you could be in it i want to be in it yeah. yeah um but yeah man it's 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 really i actually really enjoy that part and like like coming up with ideas like every day you know whatever ideas i come up with when i'm like walking yeah my kids to school or whatever i just write them down and then write a script and then we basically created a recording studio here in the office as well we bought a bunch of lights and stuff mm -hmm. um and a couple of cameras so yeah we're gonna we're, we're definitely gonna keep going on the short form video and then thinking of doing for the recruiting business maybe doing a podcast as well so maybe i'll, cool. I'll have you on as one of the first yeah guests. man you should do it yeah so many people so many people to interview <laughs> yeah in tokyo especially like it's just, just like uh yeah there's not that many podcasts i mean in Tokyo, anyways, and there's a few popping up now. I see on LinkedIn. Oh, yeah. But uh, it's still, I, I still think it's pretty, pretty early. Yeah, and I think ultimately it's going to be down to your personality, right? And you know who you are. Yeah. So I think, uh, yeah, if you're confident, you can. I, I'm sure you'll do yeah, well. Man. So how many? How often are you going to do this? I don't know. I don't know. Just uh, let's see. I mean, I think this month and and uh, the next like two three weeks, I've got like five or six every week. So see how long I can I can keep that going. Um, you know, we've got we've got like over a hundred coaches on the platform. So I mean, there's at least a few dozen people to interview. Oh, and, you're interviewing the coaches primarily. Yeah. Starting yeah, st starting starting with that. I mean, there, there's a ton of yeah interesting people that we're working with and. A lot of them are in big tech companies, but we're sort of covering different topics from like interviews to, you know, career stuff. And, mm -hmm. um, yeah. So just sort of, it's a, a bit of an experiment as well to see, to see what direction it goes in and mm -hmm. like, yeah, getting some feedback from people to see what they're most interested in. So how, how is the business doing now? How are you doing? Uh, yeah, yeah, good. I mean, we, we had, I think the beginning of the year was a bit rough, just like, I think partly seasonal, partly like some internal stuff. And then, yeah, since January, we've uh, been growing a lot more organically. So I think a big part of, of what we're doing has been just like SEO and like blogs, uh, blogs and videos and events. Mm -hmm. And that's been, uh, I think that's like been our biggest channel. Um, mm -hmm. And so, so we're a lot more consistent now uh, and the product is stable. You know, we've got a lot of great coaches 
Um, but then you've had some of these hiring freezes recently. So some uh, of these big tech companies true. that were focused on yeah. where I think that's slowed down a little bit, mm. but um, we're, we're experimenting now with just like sort of broadening that, that a little bit. So just like more general, mm. like pretty much helping anyone that's looking for a job. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, conversely, like now that there's less jobs, maybe the importance of the more competition is more valuable, right? They, they, they almost have to, yeah. Yeah get more advice i i kind of yeah i kind of missed the uh are you coaching still no, I was, are you coaching I, I was thinking about um, no. reaching out actually because it, it's you know as a side even doing two sessions a day it's, it's yeah. pretty good side income right i think i, I saw one of your yeah. um i think it was an article or a post of the the guy that does about one of our coaches yeah i think i read ten thousand dollars a month right which is yeah. like a legit that's not that does that's no longer a side hustle right that's like a legit no job well and he, he's he's a director of recruitment at, at a, a a big tech company so but even for him it's like a lot of money so i think uh, the reason he got he's a really good coach hmm. obviously but also he um he had a video that we we did together it was an event talking about the like the amazon like interview loop yeah it's like a really good video Mm. Uh, not super high quality like actual yeah. video but but the content itself was solid and as that blew up i think it got like maybe 30 or forty thousand views oh, cool. on our on our channel and then he's just been getting a, a ton of a ton of um it, you know inquiries and bookings from that so yeah so yeah that's cool i i had um i actually the last time i did like close to coaching wasn't on the karis platform it was uh it's actually a friend of mine she's like in japan she's in tokyo she's like um like half european mm -hmm. half japanese and it was really interesting she was just like lost she'd been, she'd been working for like a, a government bot like uh, entity for like two or three years straight out of university and literally was yeah. like i don't i don't really know what to do next so i gave her like you know she actually helped me out with the car business part-time as well so that was really cool. interesting like i think there's a lot of um younger people that are kind of lost right um so yeah she seemed to really um yeah she really wanted to know like you know what what is out there like not really basic stuff that's kind of awkward to say like if you don't if you literally don't know what a marketer does or really what a salesperson does you don't really mm. like we didn't really know until we worked in a job for a few years and then you kind of figure out do i actually like it or not yeah. and, you know, hopefully you, you're yeah, lucky. you've never been in that job and yeah. yeah. How do you know? Right. Um, that, that's a good point. If you're, if you're like mid level and you're, or senior, you're experienced enough, you've worked with lots of teams, but if you're, yeah, you know, early, early days in your career, it's, it's, it's a lot of like mystique around some of these job roles and job titles. Cause you don't even understand the basic business concepts to then translate that into mm. what a marketer and operations, a sales, um, or a support person, whatever, I guess an engineer, even yeah. engineering is a bit more obvious. Like it's, it's, you know, uh, there's some professions where you're through university, you, you have that aim, but there's a lot of, like, yeah. let's say white collar, uh, uh, how can I say sales related roles, for instance, and you just wouldn't know what you actually do on a day to day basis. And does it fit me? So that was something that um, I found really interesting yeah. lately. I, I kind of had two sessions with her. We literally went through LinkedIn and looked at all the different jobs. And I just gave her my view on like what I rated as a top oh, tier cool. company, like an up and coming startup that's well funded, that has a strong brand. Uh, and a lot of it just came down to, to branding actually. Like, you know, um, and that's something else that I think we, you know, you mentioned before, right? Building brands is, is something that, um, I'm trying to do with my companies but for for job seekers especially it's like really understanding like what is the value of that brand not just do i like them and want to work for them but also for your career development um because there's a couple of companies that you get yeah. on your resume and then that's like like ivy league university that, that kickstarts it right yeah 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 i had a friend who who uh he was debating he was he was like a machine learning researcher and then he was trying to get a job in tech in, yeah. in japan and it was like basically basically a choice between this like up and coming startup and then this sort of bigger bigger tech like recruitment platform and i was like look you know just jo join the bigger company oh. then you're gonna have a, a ton of choices uh you're gonna have a ton of choices in a couple of years just having that that name yeah obviously you should enjoy the job and, and so on and so forth mm. um 
but uh but yeah man i know i think we're coming up on time oh, so cool, i'll uh, i'll let you i'll let you go here in a minute um uh, but uh but yeah i i enjoyed i enjoyed the chat and i think there's some some interesting and pretty useful stuff also that came out um both like japan and non-japan related so so yeah let's see what what people uh people say cool well yeah good luck with the uh the rest of the, the podcast i'll look out for it thanks man all right i uh, hope you enjoyed that conversation with roman uh it was again a little bit different than some of the other conversations i've had it was a little bit more casual and again this is like all an experiment uh Ro- roman is actually a coach on on, on our platform on Karis. uh he's not coaching too actively to be honest but i'm still going to share his profile if, if you want to have a quick chat with him and i would definitely recommend if you are in japan if you're in tokyo especially you know check out check out his uh supercar sharing business tokyo supercars i'll link back to that it's a whole lot of fun um and um yeah i would uh i would love to hear yeah love to hear what what you found useful from from that conversation if there's anything you want to get deeper into next time i'm happy to to have him on again and dive into that so uh hope you enjoyed and i will see you in the next episode